Lord Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. We long for everything to grow dim as we gaze upon your goodness, your tenderness, your mercy, your power, your sovereignty, your fierceness against our enemies, your eagerness to seek the lost, to provide what is most needed, to lead your sheep to green pastures and still waters, to give rest for souls. Lord Jesus, you are good and you are incomparably good. There is no one else who could take that adjective when we speak it of you. You are different, you are better than every competitor, every poser, every so-called way to God or enlightenment. You are the only way. You are the truth and the life. We can only thank you that you have been kind to us to bring us to the knowledge of yourself. We pray as we look at your word this morning that you would be exalted as the good shepherd that you are, as the door to salvation, as the only way. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. In the closing months of World War II, the USS Indianapolis was tasked with a specific job. That ship was to take the Hiroshima bomb to the island of Tinian, from which it would be delivered. After it dropped off its cargo, the ship set to return home and was torpedoed by two Japanese torpedoes. It sunk with all hands. Many of the men drowned immediately, went down with the ship. Others tread water, grabbed flotsam, found ways to bundle themselves together and with anything that could float. They were in shark-infested waters, and because the mission of the USS Indianapolis had been secret, no distress signal was sent. And the men floated for days, hundreds of them, waiting for rescue. Eventually, they were discovered and rescue aircraft were sent. PBY Catalinas, seaplanes that could land on the water in rough seas and take the men aboard and get them out. Many of the men were eaten by sharks. Many of the men watched their buddies be devoured by sharks as they waited their turn to get on the airplanes. These men needed to get out. They needed to get in. They needed to get out of the shark-infested waters, and they needed to get into the rescue airplanes. We are looking this morning at John chapter 10, and God's people, and a need of rescue. A need of rescue out of man-made religious systems and a need of rescue into the love of God found only in Jesus Christ. We've been looking at John chapter 10 and this picture of Jesus the good shepherd. And the shepherding theme pervades throughout the chapter, although the metaphors will change here this morning. We will discover Jesus is the door. And I want you to read along with me our text for this morning, John chapter 10 verses 7 through 10. Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, steal and kill and destroy I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We're looking this morning at two exclusive claims that Jesus makes, two exclusive claims that every single person needs to believe. The two claims are simple. Jesus is the only way out and Jesus is the only way in. Jesus is the only legitimate way out of man-made systems and corrupt religions and anything based on self-sufficiency and the attainments of humanity. And Jesus is the only way in to heaven. That's what this section about Jesus being the door is all about. 
We're going to look at it in its details. These two authoritative claims that Jesus is the only way out and Jesus is the only way in begin in verse 7. And in verses 7 and 8, we will see that Jesus is the only way out of apostate Judaism. We looked last week at the corrupt religious system of Judaism in Jesus' day, how the leadership whose task it was to lead people to God had actually barred the way to God through their own hypocrisy, through the fact that they themselves did not know God and therefore could not lead people to God. And the only legitimate way out of the corrupt religious system, out of apostate Judaism, as we saw last week, is that someone would lawfully enter that sheepfold. That someone with the messianic credentials would go in legitimately and get his sheep out. Only Jesus qualifies. Here in John 10, the backdrop of Jesus' rescue is apostate Judaism in Jesus' day. But as we're walking our way through this text, I want you to, in your own mind, put any backdrop you like to the claims of Christ. You can put any religion as the backdrop, any self-styled guru, any worldview, any philosophy or any political ideology, any man-made system. Jesus, the good shepherd, will always be incomparably superior. And he is also the only hope out. He is the only way, the only truth, uh, the only life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. These are Jesus' claims in this text, and and they are true, true not just against the backdrop of apostate Judaism, they are true against the backdrop of self-styled atheism, or any religion you might pick. Jesus is the only way out of cold religion, out of external ceremonies, out of self-righteous attempts to merit God's favor by what you do, out of systems of hypocrites who cannot lead you to God because they do not know God. Look at verse 7. So Jesus said to them again, and the them here is the same then in chapter 10, verse 1. It is the them of John chapter 9. It is the religious leadership, the Pharisees. And Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The phrase I am is placed emphatically. It's at the front of this sentence. It's thrust forward to put Jesus out in front as making this really audacious and exclusive claim in the presence of religious leaders. Religious leaders who had set themselves up as the door, as the way. If you want to know God, you come through me. Jesus is standing in their presence and he is saying, I am. And he is not merely saying, I am a door, I am a way. He is saying, I am the door of the sheep. This is exclusive. This is a rejection of all other door claims. This is a rejection of the religious leaders right in front of Jesus as he speaks. This is a tall boast. Such a claim would be a threat to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders. They thought they were the gatekeepers. They thought that they were the way to God. If anyone was going to be blessed of God, it was by their approval, by their permission, or their declaration. It would only be by adherence to their traditions. They very much acted like they were the door. For some upstart to come along and claim to be the door would be a threat to their system and their identity. Here in John 10, 7 to 10, Jesus is changing the metaphor. John 10 is not one singular parable. You know, in the other gospel accounts of Jesus' life, you have parables. One story with a number of details taken from common life with one particular point at the end. This is not a metaphor. This is probably a figure of speech. It's a series of metaphors, not a parable. It's not a story with one point. In fact, Jesus freely exchanges the metaphors throughout John chapter 10. He is the shepherd of the sheep in verses 1 to 6. Then he is the door for the sheep in verse 7. And he's the door of salvation in verse 9. In fact, in verses 1 to 6, someone else is the doorkeeper. So the metaphor is changing. And and Jesus is using these pictures that were familiar to Middle Eastern society, an agrarian society built on the economy of sheep herding. He's using these metaphors they would be familiar with to describe various aspects of his role in the rescuing of his sheep. 
Have you ever wondered why there are so many metaphors of God or of Christ in the Bible? Have you ever thought about this? Um, God is at some times called a lion, an eagle, a lamb, a hen, a sun, a morning star, a light, a torch, a fire, a fountain, a rock, a hiding place, a tower, a shadow, a shield, a temple, a bridegroom, a husband, a father, a judge and a king, a man of war, a builder and a maker, a shepherd, a physician, and the list goes on and on through scripture. Here Jesus is called a shepherd of the sheep. Other places he's called a sheep. He is not the doorkeeper in verses 1 to 6, but in verse 7, he is the door to the sheep. Uh, He is the door, excuse me, for the sheep. And in verse 9, he is the door of salvation. Why are there so many metaphors like this? Is this not confusing? I love Robert Culver's answer to this question. The theologian says this, why are there so many names? Why are there anthropomorphisms? Why are there comparisons and symbols necessary for us? God does not need them. Why do we need them? Augustine compares soul needs with bodily needs. The body needs a place to dwell, clothing to wear, food to eat, water to drink, air and light and the like. The natural world fills the needs. The soul's needs are just as various, but instead of a world providing the supply, God himself supplies them all. You go to a fountain when you need water, but to find the fountain you need light and other things. One must go to a thousand places to meet natural needs, but all the soul's needs are met in God himself and nowhere else. Therefore, he is the bread of life, the water of life. He is Yahweh. He is most high. He is a rock and a shepherd. Bread cannot meet your shepherd need. Water does not meet your master needs and so on. Spiritually, however, God meets every need. That's right. And the metaphor is changing here in John chapter 10. Jesus here in verse 7 is said to be the door of the sheep. And and the grammar here would indicate the door for the sheep, not a door to the sheep. That is, he is an, uh, an entryway or an exit way provided for the sheep. In other words, he is the way out of corrupt Judaism. Jesus is the exit. Turn to Exodus chapter 33. You remember we talked last week that within the people of Israel, within apostate Judaism, there were sheep, those who were truly God's people. That is the spiritual Israel within the ethnic Israel. And the sheep of God needed to be drawn out of the false religious system that was present in Jesus' day. A.W. Pink supplies this parallel illustration in Exodus 33. Verse, look at verse 9. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and Yahweh would speak with Moses there. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship, each at the entrance of his tent. What's interesting about this, if you go back two verses to verse 7, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought Yahweh would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. It's an illustration that the camp had to be left for the people who wanted to seek Yahweh to go meet with Yahweh outside the tent or outside the camp. The same thing is happening here in John chapter 10. God's people are gathered in a nation, in a culture, in an ethnicity with all of the religious systems, with all of the uh, prescribed things that God had laid out in the Old Testament but then encumbered by the traditions of man that the corrupt religious leadership who did not believe in the Lord placed upon the people. God was outside the camp. And just like in Exodus 33, when Moses the shepherd led true worshipers out to meet with God, so here in John 10, Jesus is going in and getting his sheep and taking them outside. This is what Jesus means when he says, I am the door for the sheep. I am the door for the sheep. This was true in the Protestant Reformation. 
the institutional church, the visible organism that people thought was the church, was corrupt. And many of its adherents did not know the Lord at all. And yet God draw his own people out of that institutional church in the Protestant Reformation to form new bodies of believers that were made up of his sheep. We have a replay of that very phenomenon in the 20th century with the decline of the mainline denominations. Those mainline denominations in the West and in America that had faithfully taught God's word and taught people the gospel of Jesus Christ abandoned the word of God, abandoned the gospel. Men went to seminaries to try to learn how to shepherd God's people and they learned in the seminaries that God didn't write the Bible, that Jesus was a mere man and maybe a good teacher, but he made some mistakes. There was no vicarious atonement at the cross, such a thing as passe. And they learned that the Bible could not be trusted. And I've been in some of these mainline denominational churches that a long time ago have abandoned the truth and left God's people without shepherds. And I've heard sermons that were given to reading the Bible and then declaring to 10,000 people in one place, we know that's what the Bible says, but we know what really happened is, and then fill in with his own ideas. And so God's people in those mainline denominations had to find an exit door. At the beginning of the 20th century, that exit door was the Bible conference movement that spawned Bible Colleges that spawned Bible schools and educational systems and spawned Bible churches. And Bible churches are not a denomination, but truly an outgrowth of the decline of denominations in the early 20th century. So individual churches that defect from the voice of the good shepherd will find that they have left sheep without the shepherding of Jesus' voice. And any individual church that defects and falls away from the truth, gets distracted, will leave people looking for an exit door. And churches drift for a number of reasons, either doctrinal infidelity outright, we don't believe what we used to proclaim, or mission drift, that is distraction with lesser things that then takes the church's eyes off of the truth and the most important things. Or the holding on to orthodox creeds without regeneration. Cold hearts. Churches that have left their first love even while outwardly holding on to truth claims. And the good shepherd is the exit door from defunct churches, from backslidden denominations, and from corrupt systems. Jesus came in John 10 as the doorway out of apostate Judaism. Look at verse 8. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, Jesus said to the Pharisees, but the sheep did not hear them. Here again, Jesus is contrasting himself to the corrupt religious leaders. Again, this is an exclusive claim that Jesus is the door for the sheep. That's against the, the pseudo-messiahs who had, who had come during the time of Christ, and it was against the corrupt leadership of his day. When Jesus says, all who came before me, uh, he doesn't mean every single spokesman for God who has ever lived prior to the coming of Christ was a thief and a robber. Uh, we know Jesus' estimation of the patriarchs and the Old Testament saints and those who pointed to him. We know his view of Abraham and Moses and David and Isaiah. We know his view of John the Baptist. He doesn't call them thieves and robbers. He's not talking about all those who came before him in time. He's talking about those in his current day who have set themselves up as the door for God's people, as the way into relationship with God. Um, how do we know that? Right here in this text in verse 8, all who come before me are, that present tense verb is important here. They are thieves and robbers. He's talking about his contemporaries, those who have come before him as his contemporaries to lead people away from the truth. Those who self-styled way claim to be spokesmen for God. Jesus is speaking about the void of spiritual leadership in his own day. Notice Jesus' good view of the spiritual leaders that did precede him, that were legitimate spokesmen for God. Abraham, John 8, 56. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus said. And he was glad. 
Jesus says of Moses, or uh, Moses writes uh, God's prophecy concerning Moses in Deuteronomy 18, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak all that I command him. God talked to Moses about Jesus. And in John 5, 46, Jesus said of Moses, if you believed in Moses, you would believe in me for he wrote about me. And notice how those good leaders who preceded Jesus thought of Jesus. David, in Psalm 110, calls Jesus Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. David, who is king, ostensibly king over the reigning superpower of the Middle East in that day, has a Lord, a master, someone in charge of him. And Yahweh says to David's Lord, that is, God the Father says to God the Son. David acknowledges in Psalm 110, Jesus is his Lord. In Isaiah... Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah the prophet saw Yahweh, holy and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple. John 12, 41 tells us Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke of him. And you think of John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist's claim? I'm not the light. John the Baptist kept pointing to Jesus who is the light. John the Baptist said, I'm not worried to untie his shoes. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He must increase, I must decrease. What were the faithful ones who pointed to Jesus doing? Looking away from themselves and pointing to Christ. Jesus is not calling those faithful leaders thieves and robbers. The thieves and robbers are those who seek to gain a following for themselves building their own empires on the backs of the vulnerable, driven by self-interest and personal gain. They are destructive to sheep. There was the string of pseudo-messiahs who posed as self-styled rescuers of the Jewish people, people who claimed to speak for God, to gain a following, and lead their followers to eternal destruction. There were a number of them before Jesus' time and after Jesus' time who claimed some sort of messianic role, Like Judas of Galilee, who's mentioned in Acts 5, he gained a following for a little while and he led his followers in a tax evasion scheme against the Roman Empire and an ill-advised revolt. And that revolt was quashed. In our day, we might think of David Koresh in Waco, Texas in 1993 or Marshall Applewhite, the Heaven's Gate cult leader. Remember March 26, 1997, we discovered this uh, Haley Bopp comet. And the Marshall Applewhite cult decided they would graduate in the evolutionary scheme from earthly existence here to join a spacecraft that was following in the wake of the Hale-Bopp comet. In order to join that spaceship, they had to take a potion of phenobarbital and alcohol, killed themselves. A so-called Messiah leading his people to destruction. You think of Jim Jones, took his people down to Guyana, and they all drank poison Kool-Aid in a mass suicide. Those are terrible illustrations of terrible leaders very clearly taking their followers to eternal destruction. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees along similar lines. Most prominent in Jesus' indictment here are the religious leadership of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Those who had power over the people and who claimed to represent God's heart. Well, perhaps not as dramatic as a mass suicide by poison Kool-Aid or a standoff and firefight with federal agents, the religious leadership of Jesus' day were just as guilty of getting a following after themselves and taking their followers with them to eternal destruction. Listen to Luke 11.52, Jesus' words, Woe to you, scribes! You have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Jesus says. You hypocrites. You travel around on sea and on land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, he becomes twice as much a son of hell as you are. It's interesting in Matthew chapter 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said the familiar refrain, enter through the narrow gate. Broad path that leads to destruction, narrow path that leads to life, few are those who find it. 
And then in the next paragraph, he says, Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That picture of a narrow door, a narrow gate, and false teachers going hand in hand. A.W. Pink describes the false leadership of Jesus' day this way. They seized positions which they had no right to occupy. They exerted authority which they did not justly own. And they unlawfully demanded a submission and a subjection to which they could establish no valid claim. Jesus called them blind guides. They were usurpers, pretenders, hypocrites. How could unbelieving unspiritual leaders lead people to God. They had not gone through the door themselves. These leaders rejected Christ. They rejected the door. They didn't use the door. They went over the walls to get followers for themselves. And they only intended to use those sheep for their own advancement, not for the good of God's people. Any religious leader not pointing people to Jesus Christ is a usurper and does eternal violence to the immortal souls of men. And what is God's attitude towards such shepherds? Listen to Jeremiah 23. God says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares Yahweh. Therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares Yahweh. There are no minced words here in these indictments. In fact, the strongest words in Scripture are reserved for those who claim to speak for God but mislead people. Jesus called out false teachers. In fact, Paul told Timothy, a good servant of Christ Jesus points out these things to the brethren. 1 Timothy 4, 6. But notice verse 8 of John 10. But the sheep did not hear them. The sheep did not hear them. We learned last week that the sheep heard the shepherd's voice and they followed him. They followed him out. They didn't listen to these false teachers. Why? Matthew 7, 29 says they didn't speak with authority. Jesus spoke with authority. Jesus spoke from God. The door out of man-made religion, the door away from self-interested poser priests is Jesus. Jesus is different. Jesus is different than every alternative. There is no one like him. He is the only way out of man's religions. And from time to time, people jump from one religion to another. You can do that. You can get out of one bad man system to another one if you like. But they really are all the same. You can boil down the religious systems of men to one simple idea. Human achievement human achievement, or self-sufficiency, self-reliance. Every religion religion out there has something to do with you doing what's required to merit favor, to earn points with the afterlife, with some deity, some spirit, or some collection of demons. You do something in order to get something from them. Listen, you can be done with religions altogether and just trust yourself. You can say, I don't, I don't want any religion. I don't want any of that stuff. And you become a religion to yourself. You have done no better. You're still in the same hopeless condition with no remedy for sin, no avenue to God, no rest from the weariness, no cleansing of conscience. And you are still mortal. And you will meet your maker. Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, provides the only way out. In verses 9 and 10, we discover that Jesus is also the only way in. He's the only way in to heaven, the only way in to a relationship with God, the only way in to eternal life. Look down at verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. Again, Jesus gives this grammatically dramatic, emphatic statement, I am. It's one of these I am statements in the Gospel of John. It is exclusive 
and he says, I am the door. There's only one door in this statement, and he's it. Again, this is in opposition to those self-styled religious leaders who consider themselves the gatekeepers. The religious leadership made themselves out to be the doors. You got to come through us to get to God. You got to do what we say if you want any hope of spiritual life. The imposter shepherds placed unliftable burdens on God's people. And they didn't lift a finger to help. Jesus came to provide the way out of their clutches and into true spiritual life. Now this door metaphor has already been used three ways in this passage. In verse 2, the door was the door into apostate Judaism. That was the door for the true shepherd. That was the way in for Jesus. He was lawful, entered the way lawfully into the sheep pen, which was the fold of Israel. And he entered with all the messianic credentials we talked about last week. Verse 2, the door is the door into apostate Judaism. In verse 7, the door is the door out of apostate Judaism. And that is the door for the true sheep. And Jesus himself is that door. Jesus is the true door for the true sheep of God out of apostate Judaism. And in verse 9, interestingly, Jesus is simply the door. And and notice the expansion here in verse 9. If anyone... He's not just talking about the sheepfold of Israel at this point. If anyone enters through me or by me, he will be saved. Here, Jesus' claim is that he is the door of salvation. And it is a door of salvation, a door into eternal life for all who would be his sheep. Jew and Gentile alike. This is a hint towards verse 16. Jesus says, I have other sheep, not of this fold. Again, the fold here is the fold of Israel. I have other sheep, not of the fold of Israel. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Jesus came to save sinners. Jewish sinners. Gentile sinners. Brings about the reality of Ephesians 2.13. Now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off. That's us Gentiles have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus came to rescue sinners from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. That's what he's talking about here. I am the door of salvation. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And sometimes the word saved has to do with a physical rescue. You could be saved from a violent canoeing incident. But so often in scripture, this salvation has to do with eternal spiritual salvation. And it's important not to overlook the question, saved from what? What are we to be saved from? And the Bible has a number of answers to that question. We are to be saved from our sins and saved from the consequences of those sins. If there is to be salvation, we must be saved from the power of sin, that is slavery under sin's tyranny. We must be saved from the penalty of sin, that is the just punishment due our crimes against God. And we are to be saved from the very presence of sin one day. We are also to be saved out of this world, a kingdom of darkness, blinded by Satan. We are to be rescued from Satan. But ultimately, most importantly, we must be saved from God. We must be rescued away from His wrath due our sin. It is God's wrath that is our big infinite threat as sinners. And only God can undo that threat. The reality of salvation is we must be saved from God by God, unto God. That is the salvation Jesus is talking about here. And he alone is the door to that salvation. What does it mean that Jesus is the door to that salvation? Only by him, only through him, can anybody be saved. And notice the result of this salvation. They will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 9. They will go in and out and find pasture. This in and out is probably a reference to daily life. 
If Jesus, strictly speaking, is talking about in and out of the sheepfold of Israel here, he could be talking about the freedom that a believing Jew would experience, no longer subject to the harsh dictates of apostate Jewish leadership, still being geographically in Israel and culturally Jewish, now no longer under the dictates of apostate Judaism, under the thumb of unspiritual religious leaders, free to be a Jew born anew, everything a, a Jewish believer should have been in anticipating, hoping in, and believing in Messiah, and then seeing him and believing in him when he came. And what a great double blessing that would be to be an Old Testament believer anticipating Messiah and be on the earth when he came. There was a freedom there for such. This idea of finding pasture is reminiscent of the shepherd's psalm, Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. That's picked up here in this language. He will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus here, even while claiming to be the door, is still the good shepherd, and he leads his people out to good pasture. That's a picture of provision, abundant provision, lush provision, and it's a picture of rest. It's a picture of safety and security and blessing, prosperity, freedom from danger, rest for souls. There probably is an echo here of a picture of the blessings of covenant relationship to God that God himself had promised to Israel. All the way back in Deuteronomy 28, before they ever got into the land, God made promises to Israel, promises for obedience. Sort of a two-way bargain here. If you will obey me, you will be blessed in the land. Listen to the blessing side of this promise. Blessed you will be when you come in, and blessed will you be when you go out. Psalm 128, 121.8, reflecting on this, Yahweh will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And Numbers 27 also talks about this kind of a blessing. Uh, this is when Moses is uh, passing on the baton of leadership, he says, May Yahweh, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them, who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of Yahweh will not be like sheep, which has no shepherd. What does Jesus, the good shepherd, do for his people? Leads them out, brings them in. It's a picture of everyday life where God is a protector, a provider, a keeper of his people, giving them all that they need. It is a picture of what will be true of Israel collectively as a nation when God fulfills his promises to them. But as a bilateral covenant in Deuteronomy 28, meaning a, a two-way bargain, any individual Israelite would only be blessed if they were faithful to Yahweh, and any generation of Israelites would only be blessed if they were faithful to Yahweh. And so Israel, as a nation, will only be blessed when they are faithful to Yahweh. And so here in John 10, Jesus is leading his sheep out of an unfaithful Israel into green pastures in relationship to himself. For Jesus to say, I am the door. Again, it means there is only one Savior, only one hope, only one means of spiritual and eternal provision and security, only one source of life, only one way to, go, uh, only one way to God. Jesus is the door. Think about a door for just a moment. A door or a doorway or a gate is a passageway. Not a, not a long hallway, it, it, it's, it's just a threshold. And, and you cross the threshold through the door and, and you're in. And I think one of the points of Jesus' picture in calling himself the door is the pathway to eternal life is, is an easy entrance. It's a, it's a walk through a doorway. Not high walls to scale, not some labyrinth to navigate, it's not like a mouse in a maze that you got to turn all the right corners and do it just the right way in order to find the cheese at the end. There's no procedure laid out of penances for the guilt-laden sinner. 
no pilgrimages or payments or performances to do. It's not like the, the Tibetan Buddhism where you, you have to walk by the prayer wheels and spin them or, or lay up prayer flags in the Himalayan mountains and, and have the wind blow them again and again and again in a, a hopeless tirade of meaningless, empty ceremonies hoping that you do enough that maybe the spiritual force at the end will look happily upon you. It's not like the sacramental system of Roman Catholicism with all the procedures and the duties and all the things you have to do that that become vehicles of God's favor to you if you just do them and do them the right way and do enough of them and and hope that you've ended up in a state where enough of them were, were done to counteract the bad things that you've done. It's not like the five pillars of Islam. Where, where, where you got to take a pilgrimage, the Hajj, or, or maybe participate in jihad and, and, and give your money away. And, and if you do all of those things just right and, and the prayers every day and in just the right fashion, hopefully you've done it enough to make the bar so that some deity might be pleased with you in the end. And, and there's no guarantee. All of those things. Every system is works, 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 works all the time. Mechanical performances, a lifetime of labors with no guarantee of life. No green pastures, no still waters. When Jesus says, I am the door, it is a simple step through and you're in. That simple step is faith. Faith walks through the door. There is only one way, only one door. You know what that one way is. It is Jesus. You believe in that one way and you walk through that one way. Faith is not just the recognition that there is a door. Saving faith recognizes the only door and walks through it. But you walk through that door, which is Jesus, and you are in Just as there was only one door on the ark that Noah built, his family walked through that door and they were rescued from God's judgment on the earth. There was only one door into the tabernacle in the wilderness to meet with God. There is only one door to eternal life and that door is Jesus the Messiah. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. And that door one day will be shut. Just like the door on the ark that floated on the floodwaters, that door was shut. Listen to Jesus' warning in Luke 13. The head of the house will get up and shut the door. And you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you're from. This is why 2 Corinthians 6 says, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. While Jesus, the door, puts himself in front of you and invites you to walk through, this is the day. That door will not always be there. Revelation 6, 17 is coming. The great day of their wrath. That is the wrath of God the Father and the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of Christ himself. That day will come. And who is able to stand? How does one get through this door? Faith in Christ alone. How does one get through the door? Jesus tells us in Luke 15. Speaking of a shepherd going after a lost sheep, he says the shepherd finds the sheep, lays the sheep on on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and he says to them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. How does a sheep get through the door? Faith. Believe in Jesus. How does a sheep get through the door? Jesus comes and picks you up and puts you over his shoulders and carries you through. This is why Jesus says, I call my sheep, they hear my voice, and they come. Look down at verse 10. Both of these exclusive claims of Jesus come with a contrast. Look at the contrast here. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
The contrast here is to the bad shepherds, the phony spiritual leaders, corrupt religionists. What do they do? They, they kill and they destroy. And, and they might have the outward appearance of spirituality, of morality, of enlightenment, of authority. But they are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. One of the significant backdrops of John chapter 10 is the prophet Ezekiel. And the 34th chapter of Ezekiel. I want you to turn there. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. This is such an important backdrop for this chapter. We'll revisit it a couple of times as we make our way through John 10. Here's God's word to Ezekiel the prophet. Son of man, he says, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord Yahweh, woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? See the difference. Spiritual leaders were to provide for sheep, not eat the sheep. Verse 3, you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back. You have not sought for the lost, but with force and severity you have dominated them. That is the scene in John 9. A man born blind, more, more vulnerable, more needy than anybody you can imagine, set to a life of begging, should have been the object of compassion and care for the shepherds of Israel. And they dominated him with force instead of providing spiritual light to him. And notice in Ezekiel 34, the bad shepherds there are acting like owners of the flock. They're not owners. The picture here in Ezekiel 34 are shepherds who work at the behest of the owner of the flock. And a shepherd in the wilderness in the ancient Near East was allowed to have some of the milk from the flock. That was company policy. That was acceptable. But he was not allowed to shear the wool off the flock and make a sweater for himself. And he was not allowed to kill the sheep and eat them. And that is the picture given here of these bad shepherds. So when Jesus said the thief comes to kill and to destroy, he is picking up the language in the picture of Ezekiel 34. He is the contrast to it. Jesus, the good shepherd. What does he come for? John 10.10. 10, that they, the sheep, may have life. And have it abundantly. He's going to heal the brokenhearted. He's going to bind up the wounded. He's going to care for them. And the grammar of verse 10 is abrupt and emphatic. Jesus is different. There's, there's no conjunction here. This is sometimes we might expect, well, the thieves are like this, but I'm like this. It's just stark, bare statements like sheer walls up against each other. The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. I came to give life. Not to sap life, but to give it. Not to use people for self-aggrandizement, but to give himself in order to rescue people. The religious posers and empire builders trampled people to get what they want. You know, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. That was their perspective. Like those who built the pyramids on the bodies of dead slaves, the leaders of religious empires gladly crush people to build monuments to themselves. The thief is malevolent. Jesus is benevolent. The thief doesn't care for the lives of the sheep. Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. To the thief, a sheep is a means to a selfish end. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is not one among many leaders of religions in the world. He's not the best of a long line of religious teachers. He is fundamentally different than everyone and everything else. And so we dispense with all false notions of Jesus. He was a good teacher. He was a moral example, maybe a martyr for his cause or a revolutionary. No, none of those are adequate. Jesus is God in the flesh. And he came to rescue his people from their sin. And he did so by going to the cross where he died the ignominious death, a scandalous death of a criminal, of a low life. 
And while he was, humanly speaking, trumped up on false charges, mistreated, Jesus said, I came to lay down my life. He'll say in John 10, nobody takes it from me. Jesus intentionally went to the cross as a substitute sacrifice for the sins that his sheep committed so that he could pay for those sins to bring his sheep through the door. Jesus didn't die as a victim. It was not an accident of happenstance. Jesus was intentionally crushed by his father in inner Trinitarian agreement to be the sacrifice that would satisfy God's wrath against sin to bring his people home. And he says, I, gave, I came to give them life abundant. What is this word abundance? It means more than enough beyond what is required. Christian, you know this abundant life. You know it already. When you think about what it was like to be aware of your sins truly for the first time, to know you needed a savior, to know that you were in trouble with God and there was no hope and that Jesus Christ was your only hope and he was like that treasure in the field. You sell everything to go get it. I don't care what it cost me. I must have Jesus. And he is so beautiful and so kind and so good at the same time being really scary and glorious and big and great. And I know I must have him. And then on the back side of that, you think, I've got my sins forgiven. I need nothing else. And what else has God seen fit to give you in the Christian life? Oh, so much. Houses and lands and mothers and fathers and daughters and friends. This body of believers. An indwelling Holy Spirit. Power over sin. New capacities. New affections. New desires. A direction of life you could not even think of on your own. Newfound freedom. You are now internally compelled and driven to things that are actually good. You are magnetically drawn to things that produce life. And you have peace with God. Rest for your soul. You also have in this Christ life things like discipline. Loving discipline from a heavenly father who won't let you get too far away from that which is good. Suffering that produces an eternal weight of glory. And for your life in Christ, you get from the world ridicule, scorn, persecution, cost. Maybe for some of you, it is cost relationships, family, friendships. But you have Christ. And all of this is part of green pastures and still waters. And all of that is now. What do we have later? Eternal rest. No more sin. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more enemies or persecution. No calamities. No more death. The green pastures and still waters that God provides for his sheep are forever. Provision, prosperity, blessing, security, the enjoyment of his goodness in never ending and ever increasing happiness. And Christian, you were plucked off the hamster wheel of self-sufficiency, the rat race of human attainment. You know, the perpetual chase and, and the never getting of Temporary things, vanities, emptinesses, the nothings that this world goes after. You were chasing after wind, running after foolish distractions and temporal distortions. And all those things that look like joys that evaporate in the morning sun. Do you remember before you knew Christ? How you thought just around the corner is that next thing that's going to bring me happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, joy, ultimate things. And it was never there. And God got you off of that rat race. See, man was built to know God. And everyone knows this. The rejection of God. 
A rebellious rejection of what you know you were built for can only result in insanity and emptiness. Oh, the human condition is a diseased rebellion with awful consequences. And Jesus came to rescue. No religion of man could ever do what Jesus does. But the door, the only door, Jesus the Messiah is our hope. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are good. You are so infinitely good to everyone in this room who knows you. We have tasted and we have seen that you are good. God, keep us from distractions. Keep us from those distortions around us that cause us to forget, to temporarily chase after worthless things. And God, we would plead with you this day for those that are here, for those that are listening, who have never tasted your goodness in Jesus Christ, would you compel them, O oh God? Drag them through the door. Let them know green pastures and still waters. Let them have eternal life through simple faith in what your son did at the cross. God, would you rescue your own even here today? And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name.